Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Vice Chancellor's Open Lecture and a special welcome to Professor Pater Chatterjee in the front here, our guest speaker. It's lovely to see lots of students at, at the lecture as well as staff, and uh, I know there will also be some members of the public, so welcome to all of you. Professor Chatterjee is a political theorist, anthropologist, and historian. He's visiting the University of Cape Town as a guest of the Program for the Enhancement of Research Capacity. Most of you only know that as PERC, P-E-R-C, uh, and the university's research office. He was born in Calcutta in 1947, which was, of course, the year that India achieved independence. And he grew up in, an Im in the embattled period of transition, which forms uh, that early post-colonial period and the shift to mass democracy in India. Professor Chatterjee received his first degree in political science from the Presidency College, Calcutta, in the late 1960s, in a climate of immense political upheaval. He went on to do his PhD in political science at Rochester University in the United States, where he also received training in formal logical methods of rational choice theory. And it's interesting then that his uh, early work and his first monograph, which was called Arms, Alliances, and Stability, the Development of Structure of, structure of International Politics in 1975, creatively used mathematical theory to assert a developing world Marxist perspective in the discussion of global nuclear politics. Professor Chatterjee returned to India in 1972, just as the most severely authoritarian phase of Indian democracy began to unfold. He joined the Center for, Study, for Studies in Social Sciences, uh, Kolkata, in 1973, and worked there for some 25 years, 35 years, uh, with uh, 10 years, the last 10 years as its director. So although, and then although he retired from there a couple of years ago, he continues as an honorary professor there. He became active in the early 70s and 80s in campaigns for civil liberties and the movement to free political prisoners in India. And it's worth noting that it was also this period uh, that he, um, his, histori his systematic historical research began, and importantly, as a result of his extensive travel, he's spending increasingly longer periods of time in rural India, uh, his thinking was shaped importantly into, and, and he coined the concept political society as an arena of popular action, a concept which has sparked off lively debates across many fields in many countries. So he holds joint professorships now uh, with two distinguished universities. Since 1997, he has held uh, the position of um, Professor of Anthropology and South Asian Studies at Columbia University, New York, and he remains an honorary professor of political science at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, uh, Kolkata. He was awarded the uh, Fukuoka Asian Culture Prize in 2009 for outstanding achievements in the field of Asian studies. And the impact of his work has not only been transnational, but also transdisciplinary. Scholars from all walks of the humanities, including history, politics, sociology, anthropology, literary studies, and cultural studies, continue to find his work engaging, inspiring, and challenging. Professor Chatterjee is a founding member of what came to be, to what came to be known as the Subaltern Studies Collective, which began as a group of Indian historians who felt in the early 1980s that Indian history was limited because it adopted a perspective that was influenced by an elite, the nationalist uh, bourgeoisie, and omitted the perspectives and voices of those outside the centers of power, such as peasants and workers. Critical of imperial, nationalist, and orthodox Marxist styles of underplaying popular agency, this innovative approach came to substantially redefine the writing of history, not only in South Asia, but also the global South at large. Professor Chatterjee has edited or co-edited some of the most influential volumes on South Asian history and politics, including Texts of Power, History and the Present, History in the Vernacular, and shortly forthcoming New Cultural Histories of India. Of course, he has published, in addition, many books himself and articles far too numerous for me to list 
in this introduction. And finally, a major focus of Professor Chatterjee's work is nationalism and how that is defined in terms of colonialism, post-colonialism, -colonial modernity, and the idea of the nation state. And it's these, especially these areas of work that uh, informs his public lecture this, e this evening. Professor Chatterjee, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you to UCT. I know you've had a busy schedule and it continues still with seminars and lectures to many different groups of the university. Uh, and I uh, ask you to welcome him to the podium. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Price, for that <coughs> wonderfully generous introduction. Uh, this is, in fact, my second visit to, to this campus, but the first one was some 15 years ago. Uh, it was a very rushed uh, visit on the occasion of a conference. This is a more, uh, I'm here for a more extended period of time, and I'm uh, really enjoying my interactions with both the faculty and students in the course of several events uh, over this week. Um, uh, this, of course, is my largest audience, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, my uh, talk tonight is entitled Modern Empires and Nations. Uh, empire and nation are familiar terms in India as well as South Africa. A common history of British colonialism also means that many specific institutions and practices of the British Empire are shared in the historical memory of the two countries. This renders my task today somewhat easier than it might have been otherwise. I can speak of the history of modern empires and nations by referring to this common history of the British Empire and its dissolution. Although I will speak more of a particular Indian story, I hope to be able to suggest to you many parallels with the history of imperialism and nationalism in the former British colonies of Africa. I'm not sure how many of you in this audience have heard of the Black Hole of Calcutta. 50 years ago, it was known to every schoolchild in Britain. In fact, it was said that if a person in the English-speaking world knew only one thing about India, it was likely to have been the infamous Black Hole incident. Today, I would be surprised if even one in a million knows anything about it. So, what was the Black Hole of Calcutta and what happened inside it? Delousey Square is the heart of the administrative district of Calcutta. On the western side of the square stands one of the more distinctive buildings of colonial Calcutta, the General Post Office. That's the one you see there. Built in the classical style with Corinthian columns and a Renaissance dome. High up on the eastern wall of the post office, there is a small plaque. It says somewhat obscurely, the brass lines in the adjacent steps and pavement mark the position and extent of part of the southeast bastion of old Fort William, the extreme southeast point being 95 feet from this wall. The brass lines are difficult to find, but along one of the lower steps, there's a strip of what looks like wrought iron running southwards for a few yards and then coming to an abrupt stop. There is no further clue here to the mystery of the fort wall. Leading south from Delousey Square is Council House Street. That's the street you see going that way, which runs past the yard of St. John's Church. Built in 1787, its yard had, has some of the oldest funerary architecture from British Calcutta, including the mausoleum of Job Charnock, who founded the first English settlement here. More to our interest is... Uh, more to our interest, however, is a monument that stands near the western wall of the churchyard, surrounded by overgrown shrubs and piles of rubbish. It's a white marble obelisk on an octagonal base with inscribed tablets on six of its sides and a floral frieze on the other two. The main inscription reads as follows. This monument has been erected by Lord Curzon, Viceroy and Governor General of India in the year 1902 upon the site and in reproduction of the design of the original monument to the memory of the 123 persons who perished in the Black Hole prison of Old Fort William on the night of the 20th of June, 1756. 
The former memorial was raised by their surviving fellow sufferer, J. Z. Holwell, governor of Fort William, on the spot where the bodies of the dead had been thrown into the ditch of the Ravelin. It was removed in 1821. The next tablet has the names of 27 persons who Holwell originally listed as having died in the black hole. Two other tablets list 54 additional victims whose names, it says, had been recovered from oblivion by reference to contemporary documents. This, this memorial is actually in the wrong place because this is neither the site of the black hole prison nor where the bodies of the victims were allegedly thrown. At the base of the monument is another inscription that says, this monument was erected in 1902 by Lord Curzon on the original site of the black hole, northwest corner of Delousey Square, and removed thence to the cemetery of St. John's Church, Calcutta, in 1940. We are dealing then with two monuments. The original monument, by all accounts, stood somewhere at the northwest corner of what was then called the Tank Square. Sorry. Uh, let me stay with this. The original monument stood somewhere at the northwest corner what was of what was then called the Tank Square. We know from the records that the ruins of the old fort of Calcutta, including the site of the Black Hole Prison, were demolished in 1818. The Holwell Monument stood outside the walls of the old fort. It's not clear why the original monument was pulled down in 1821, but we do know that it was designed and built probably in 1760 by John Zephania Holwell, a survivor of the Black Hole incident, to whom we owe the only detailed narrative of the event. The inscription on the front of the monument then had the names of 48 persons who it was announced with sundry other inhabitants, military and militia, to the number of 123 persons, were by the tyrannic violence of Siraj Dola, Suba of Bengal, suffocated in the black hole prison of Fort William in the night of the 20th day of June, 1756, and promiscuously thrown the succeeding morning into the ditch of the ravelin of this place. This monument is erected by their surviving fellow sufferer, J. Z. Holwell. On the reverse of the monument, the inscription said, this horrid act of violence was as amply as deservedly revenged on Siraj Dola by his majesty's arms under the conduct, conduct of Vice Admiral Watson and Colonel Clive, anno 1757. So what happened in Calcutta on the night of June 20th, 1756? The center of Calcutta in 1756 was a small fort with earth and ballast bastions and brick walls. This was the fortified settlement of the East India Company in Bengal. <coughs> the town had grown phenomenally in the first half of the 18th century and its total population in 1756 could have been in the region of 100,000. The British population probably numbered no more than 400, mostly male, <coughs> a large part being soldiers. The Indian population lived in the black town north of the fort. The company had held from 1698 the three villages constituting Calcutta as the zamindar or landlord with the right to settle people and collect revenue. In 1717, the company secured from the Mughal emperor permission to trade without paying customs duties. The Nawab of Bengal allowed the company's goods to be transported without duties but not those that belonged to the company's officials. However, company servants routinely tried to carry out their private trade under the company's seal to evade customs charges. The company's settlement in Calcutta was steadily fortified through the first half of the 18th century, sometimes with the permission of the Nawab's government, but often without. The company's directors in London were always concerned about the need to defend their settlement in Bengal in order to protect their trade. But it was not merely a question of the company's trade. There was also the private trade of the company officials. For those who chose to sail to India in the company's service, the lure of a fortune acquired in a few years through private trade was the most powerful attraction because the actual pay was paltry between 50 to 100 pounds annually. 
Most who came out from Britain hated the conditions in Bengal. They disliked the climate, they disliked the sicknesses that recurred so frequently, they disliked the blacks. But they all looked forward to returning home after 10 or 15 years with enough of a fortune to live free and independent like a gentleman. This could mean savings of something like 25,000 pounds, acquired mainly through private trade. That could allow one to live the life of a small squire. By 1750, the British position in Bengal became entangled in the extension of European political rivalries in Asia. The aggressive policies of the French governor Duplex of Pondicherry led to major military and diplomatic successes over the British in South India, and now he was looking to Bengal. The British, however, were not slow to pick up the cue. Robert Orme, later the official historiographer of the conquest of Bengal, was advising Robert Clive as early as 1752 to consider toppling Alivardi Khan, Nawab of Bengal. He said, the Nawab coming down with all his excellencies cannon to Hooghly and with an intent to bully all the settlements out of a large sum of money, Clive, it would be a good deed to swing the old dog. I don't speak at random when I say that the company must think seriously of it or it will not be worth the while to trade in Bengal. In 1756, the 80 year old Alivardi died. His grandson, Sirajuddaullah, succeeded him and immediately demanded that the company stop any further fortification of Calcutta. The Nawab's emissary, however, was unceremoniously dismissed by Robert Drake, governor of Fort William. Humiliated, he returned to Mushidabad, the capital of, uh, of Bengal then, and complained, what honor is left to us when a few traders who have not yet learned to wash their bottoms reply to the ruler's order by expelling his envoy? Siraj Dola, by all accounts, was enraged. The recent conflicts between the British and the French in South India were known, to the Nawab, known in the Nawab's capital, Murshidabad, and it was reasonable for Siraj to think that he should not allow any of the Europeans to build fortified enclaves in Bengal. Siraj retaliated immediately. On June 16, 1756, the Nawab, personally leading a force of some 30,000 men with heavy artillery, arrived in the vicinity of Calcutta. At Fort William, the number of armed men available to defend it was around 500, of whom no more than half were European, including soldiers, militia, and volunteers, the rest consisting of Armenians, Indo-Portuguese, and Indians. The Nawab's forces began an assault on all fronts on June 16th. After three days of battle, a majority in the council at Fort William was arguing in favor of abandoning the fort and returning to the ships anchored in the river. Morale was desperately low, and every black fellow who could make his escape ran away. On the night of June 18th, it was direct decided that the European women in the fort should be escorted to the boats waiting on the river. When the Nawab's army resumed its assault in the morning, the ship Dodali appeared up the river below the fort, there was a general desertion. Everyone who could find a place on a boat left. By noon, Governor Drake himself was gone, sailing downstream. <clears throat> Soon there were no more boats available, even though many, including eight members of the council, were still waiting in the fort, ready to leave. The defenders were stranded in the besieged fort. The governor himself, having ingloriously deserted, the remaining members of the council elected Holwell as governor of Fort William. But with so many senior officers gone, it was impossible to maintain discipline. Many European soldiers virtually mutinied, forcing their way into the stores, helping themselves to the liquor, and subsequently deserting in the night. On June 20th, after further fighting, Holwell was left with no more than 150 men, demoralized and exhausted of strength and vigor. He signaled for a truce. By the evening, the fort was occupied by the Nawab's troops. Holwell was brought before Siraj Dola, who expressed much resentment against Drake. The Indo-Portuguese, Armenian, and Indian men in the fort were allowed to leave. The remaining Europeans were left in charge of the Nawab's guards. No violence was done to them. At this time, some of the Europeans, apparently under the influence of liquor, <coughs> 
misbehaved with the guards, at least one of whom received fatal injuries. When this was reported, either the Nobab or one of his officers ordered that the Europeans be put in confinement within the fort. It was discovered that there was a cell, picturesquely called the black hole, which was used by fort officials to lock up unruly Europeans. This was where the European prisoners were confined during the night of June 20th. The first accounts of the black hole inc incident were produced between July 5th, 1756 and February 1757. The historian Brijen Gupta has carefully compiled a full list of 13 such sources that have come down to us. Gupta shows with impeccable reasoning that John Zephania Holwell was directly involved in the production of every single one of these narratives. That is to say, they are not independent pieces of evidence, but rather all of them were the result of consultations with Holwell or of a reading of his various descriptions of the event. It's to Holwell's narrative, then, that we must turn, as indeed has everyone else in the last 250 years, for an account of what happened on the night of June 20th, 1756, at Fort William. Holwell came from a merchant family with education. He was trained as a doctor and came out to India as a surgeon's mate. In Calcutta, he showed his skills in judicial and revenue administration and became mayor of the settlement, as well as the youngest member of the council. After his final return to Britain in 1760, he emerged as something of a specialist in Indian affairs, wrote historical and ethnographic tracts, and became a fellow of the Royal Society. He was keen to display his superior moral and intellectual qualities in comparison with the usual run of greedy adventurers who came out to India in the company service. He wrote the genuine narrative on board the Siren in February 1757 on his journey back to Britain from Bengal. By then, Calcutta had been recaptured by Clive's army. Holwell was now feeling much better. He had had a leisure to reflect, since no one who had survived the night when Fort William fell had written down a detailed narrative, he felt it necessary to do so. By the time Holwell's narrative was published, Siraj Dola had been defeated at Polashi, or Tlasi, and killed. Robert Clive and the East India Company were in full charge of political affairs in Bengal. Figure to yourself, my friend, if possible, the situation of 146 wretches, exhausted by continual fatigue and action, thus crammed together in a cube of about 18 feet in a close sultry night in Bengal, shut up to the eastward and southward, the only quarters from whence air could reach us, by dead walls, and a wall and door to the north, open only to the westward by two windows, strongly barred with iron, from which we could receive scarce any the least circulation of fresh air. Holwell and the other European defenders of the fort had been ordered at about eight o'clock that night into the Black Hole prison by the Nawab's guards and forced through the only door. Somewhat improbably, considering the smallness of the room in relation to the numbers that had to be packed inside, quote, I'm quoting from Holwell, like one agitated wave impelling another, we were obliged to give way and enter. The, less, the rest followed like a torrent. Few amongst us, the soldiers accepted, having the least idea of the dimensions or nature of a place we had never before seen. So begins a tale of innocence. It was not Siraj Dola, Holwell is careful to point out, who had ordered them to be locked up in that particular room. What followed, he says, was the result of revenge and resentment in the breasts of the guards to whose custody we were delivered. Before he went in, Holwell had been approached by Leach, the company's smith, who offered to escort Holwell to a boat in which he could escape. Quote, I thanked him in the best terms I was able, but told him it was a step I could not prevail on myself to take, as I should thereby very ill repay the attachment the gentlemen and the garrison had shown to me, and that I was resolved to share their fate, be it what it would. Clearly, Holwell's, Holwell is keen to emphasize that he was not, like the other officials who had deserted the fort, this was, after all, also a tale of duty. In his attitude and mental poise, <clears throat> Holwell was also utterly different from most of his fellow prisoners. 
They were far, far too susceptible to the violence of passions, whereas he knew immediately, quote, that the only chance we had left for sustaining this misfortune and surviving the night was the preserving of a calm mind and quiet resignation to our fate. This indeed is the dominant theme of his narrative, not the perfidy of Siraj or the cruelty of his guards, but the descent of a crowd of ordinary European men placed in a situation of dangerous adversity into mindless disorder and his own heroic struggle to retain control and discipline over his body. <laughs> Looking out of the window, Holwell noticed that an old guard, quote, seemed to carry some compassion for us in his countenance. He spoke to him and offered to pay him a thousand rupees the next day if he would arrange to shift half of the prisoners to another room. The guard went away and came back to announce that the Nawab had gone to sleep and no one dared wake him up. At this time, Holwell noticed that having perspired profusely, everyone was inflicted by a raging thirst, which, quote, increased in proportion as the body was drained of its moisture. Once again, Holwell could only be a mute witness to the folly of his ignorant fellow, uh, fellow prisoners. They decided to take off their clothes. Quote, in a few minutes, I believe every man was stripped, myself and the two wounded young gentlemen by me excepted. For a little time, they flattered themselves with having gained a mighty advantage. When everyone was clamoring for water, the old guard took pity and ordered some skins of water. Holwell immediately knew this would have fatal effects. Quote, this was what I dreaded. I foresaw it would prove the ruin of the final chance left us and essayed many a times to speak to him privately to forbid its being brought. But the clamor was so loud, it became impossible. Paradoxically then, a humane gesture from a prison guard brought on the destruction of a crowd of thoughtless prisoners unable to rise above their animal instincts. As soon as the water arrived, there was a mad rush for it. Those near the window filled up their hats to the full, but, quote, there ensued such violent struggles and frequent contests to get at it that before it reached the lips of anyone, there would be scarcely a small teacup full left in them. <coughs> the insufficient supply of water only increased the thirst. Quote, the confusion now became general and horrid, and the throng and press upon the window was beyond bearing, many forcing their passage from the further part of the room, pressed down those in their way who had let strength and trampled them, trampled them to death. Holwell, of course, refused to drink the water. Instead, quote, I kept my mouth moist from time to time by sucking the perspiration out of my shirt sleeves and catching the drops as they fell like heavy rain from my head and face. You can hardly imagine how unhappy I was if any of them escaped my mouth. Soon he discovered that the man next to him, naked like the rest of the prisoners, was also sucking his sleeve. Quote, After I detected him, I had ever the address to begin on that sleeve first, when I thought my reservoirs were sufficiently replenished, and our mouths and noses often met in the contest. <laughs> the scene inside the prison was one of violent confusion. The prison guards seemed to find this amusing. Holwell was incensed. Quote, can it gain belief that this scene of misery proved entertainment to the brutal wretches without? But so it was, and they took care to keep us supplied with water that they might have the satisfaction of seeing us fight for it. For Holwell, it was unforgivable that native eyes should have been allowed to witness the descent of a group of Europeans into a state of natural savagery. All he could do by way of retaliation was transfer the attribute of brutality from his benighted compatriots to the amused Indian prison guards. By half past 11, quote, they whose strength and spirits were quite exhausted laid themselves down and expired quietly upon their fellows. Others who had yet some strength and vigor left made a last effort for the windows. Many to the right and left sunk with the violent pressure and were soon suffocated. For now, a steam arose from the living and the dead which affected us in all its circumstances as if we were forcibly held with our heads over a bowl full of strong, volatile spirit of hartshorn until suffocated. By two o'clock, Holwell felt so exhausted 
that he pulled out his penknife, determined to slit open his arteries. Quote, when heaven interposed and restored me to fresh spirits and resolution with an abhorrence of the act of cowardice I was just going to commit. <clears throat> Soon, however, he passed out. When day broke, some of the prisoners recognized him by his shirt, buried under a pile of naked dead bodies, and realized he was still alive. In the meantime, the Nawab apparently gave orders that the prisoners be released. Quote, but, oh, sir, what words shall I adopt to tell you the whole that my soul suffered at reviewing the dreadful destruction around me? I will not attempt it. And indeed, tears stop my pen. Holwell was taken to Siraj Dola. After a drink of water, Holwell tried to describe to the Nawab the terrible suffering the prisoners had undergone. Quote, but he stopped me short with telling me he was well informed of great treasure being buried or secreted in the fort and that I was privy to it, and if I expected favor, must discover it. Holwell disclaimed all knowledge of any treasure. Frustrated, Siraj ordered him to be taken under guard to Murshidabad. Holwell's trip to Murshidabad as a prisoner was arduous. Every at every step, he was told that he was no longer the chief of Calcutta and that he must obey. As he and three other English prisoners were paraded down the streets of Murshidabad, they were apparently noticed by the old Begum, Alivardi's widow and Siraj's grandmother, who, taking pity on them, probably interceded with the Nawab on their behalf. The next day, the prisoners were presented before Siraj. Quote, the wretched spectacle we made must, I think, have made an impression on a breast the most brutal. And if he is capable of pity or contrition, his heart felt it then. I think it appeared in spite of him in his countenance. The Nawab ordered that the chains be removed and Holwell and his companions allowed to go wherever they chose. A final point before we leave Holwell's narrative. In the course of his description of the chaotic scenes inside the Black Hole prison, Holwell mentioned a certain naval officer called Carey and added in parentheses, almost as an afterthought, quote, his wife, a fine woman, though country-born, would not quit him, but accompanied him into the prison, and who was one who survived. On the morning of June 21st, after Holwell and three others were ordered to be sent to Mushidabad, the rest of the prisoners were set free, except, says Holwell, Mrs. Carey, who was too young and handsome. Other than this tantalizingly brief clause, not a word more is said about her. Much would be made of Mrs. Carey later. There is no doubt that Holwell had an ax to grind. The civil and military leadership of the settlement had disgracefully abandoned the fort, and Holwell had been left behind to negotiate the inevitable surrender. The temptation would have been overwhelming for him to paint in the most dramatic colors the adversity of his situation and the heroism of his devotion to duty, especially in a tract intended to be read by the company's stockholders and members of the public in Britain. But a careful reader of the narrative cannot but conclude that the predominant theme is not the brutality of the Bengal Nawab or his soldiers, but the value of mental self-discipline and informed moral judgment in coping with unanticipated disaster. The charge of brutality against Siraj is, in the narrative, nothing more than a prejudice, assumed as part of the background. He appears impatient and willful, perhaps, but not in any way cruel, and indeed not devoid of compassion. Some of his guards are positively helpful towards the prisoners. Holwell's tract is actually pedagogical, not accusatory. He was writing to establish what may be called elevated principles of moral discipline as the guide to self-governance for his own people. What the Indians had seen of Europeans that night in Fort William had destroyed every claim of the civilizational superiority of white Christian nations. The task was, Holwell seemed to be saying, the moral education of the British people to make them worthy of ruling over Indians steeped in tyranny and depravity. In making this plea, he was somewhat ahead of his times. It has often been said <clears throat> in the last two centuries that the British acquired the territories of Bengal without ever having planned to do so. 
The description was turned into a much repeated aphorism by the historian John Seeley, who remarked in 1882, quote, we seem, as it were, to have conquered and peopled half the world in a fit of absence of mind. <laughs> of course, it is necessary to remind ourselves that the idea that empires are founded by single individuals of rare genius is a prejudice we have carried over from older histories of bygone empires. Modern empires, like modern capitalism and modern nation states, do not have founders, notwithstanding the persistent desire in certain quarters to claim and celebrate them. The founding of the British Empire in India is usually dated to June 23rd, 1757, almost exactly a year after the Black Hole incident. On this day, the East India Company's forces led by Robert Clive defeated Siraj Dola on the battles of Palashi and installed Mir Jafar as the first of a series of puppet Nawabs of Murshidabad. The battle was preceded by an inglorious conspiracy between British officials and ministers of the Nawab's court involving deception, betrayal, forged signatures, and the transfer of unheard of quantities of money and treasure. The conspiracy ensured that about two-thirds of the Nawab's army merely stood by as the so-called revolution in Bengal took place. For the next eight years, the functionaries of the company carried out what can only be described as the unrestrained plunder of Bengal. Each official sent out their private agents into the countryside to trade without paying taxes in virtually every commodity. They used the company's troops to support their private trade against competitors and to dictate prices. The scale of some of these private operations is staggering. William Boltz employed 150 Indian agents to manage his personal trade. Archibald Keir employed 13,000 men to manufacture 12,000 tons of salt on his behalf. Profit margins for British traders in Bengal were several times what they could have expected in Britain. Yet another means of plunder were the so-called presents to company officials from Indians eager to please them. Robert Clive, who regarded himself as morally superior to his greedy and self-serving compatriots in Bengal, appears to have stayed away from private trade, but took home probably the largest fortune of all, consisting mainly of money, jewels, and precious objects gifted to him, often from the government treasury, by prominent people in India. But Clive was not the only one. Anyone of any consequence in the company used his position to ask for and receive presents from Indians he dealt with. Even John Holwell, self-proclaimed model of rectitude and devotion to duty, is on record complaining from Britain in 1763 to the new Nawab Mir Qasim that he had only received 50,000 rupees of his promised present of 200,000. It was noted by an official committee in Britain that between 1757 and 1765, presents worth more than two million pounds taken out of Bengal could be actually listed. In 1765, Clive wrote, quote, it is scarcely a hyperbole to say that the whole Mughal Empire is in our hands. He negotiated an agreement with the emperor by which the East India Company acquired the right to collect the land revenues of Bengal. A few years later, he boastfully referred in parliament to the Mughal emperor as de jure Mughal, de facto nobody at all, and to the Nawab of Bengal as de jure Nawab, de facto the East India Company's most obedient humble servant. But the company insisted that, the so that sovereignty in Bengal belonged to the Mughal emperor. The government of William Pitt the Elder tried to argue that since the territories of Bengal, the larger in extent than France and Spain put together, had been acquired by force of arms, they should rightfully belong to the crown and not the company. But the company also had influential supporters in parliament. Indeed, 23% of members of parliament owned East India Company stocks, and at least a dozen had their elections financed by former company officials. This made the company one of the most powerful interest groups in Britain. In 1767, a compromise was hammered out by which the company agreed to pay an annual sum of 400,000 pounds to the British Crown in return for which a decision on sovereignty in India was postponed indefinitely. 
Indeed, no matter what the legal quibbles and deals in Parliament, a historical justification of the conquest of Bengal had been worked out among company officials expressed most elaborately by Robert Orme in 1763. Unlike the earlier debates over the empire in America, there was no attempt here to apply the Roman law concepts of dominium and imperium, nor was it possible to claim in the manner of John Locke that the British had title to the land in India because they were the first to productively cultivate it. Rather, the historical fiction was that the native inhabitants of India, whom the British then called the Gentoos, were industrious and skilled manufacturers and cultivators, adept at commerce, but naturally servile, inherently incapable of defending themselves with arms. Not surprisingly, they had been conquered and ruled for centuries by warlike Muslim invaders, referred to as Moors, who had imposed a vicious tyranny that was hostile to trade and commerce. The British, drawn into the politics of the country in order to defend their trading interests, had been forced to seize power to protect and promote commerce. There was no promise at this juncture that the British would, under the given conditions, provide better government to Indians. In 1769-70, there was a massive famine in Bengal. Historians estimate that a third of the population of Bengal was wiped out, making it one of the worst famines in modern history. Its effects did not show up in the company's revenues, however, because collections from landowners and cultivators were, according to official reports, violently kept up to its former standard. But it was apparent to all informed observers that there was a massive problem building up with the administration of the conquered province of Bengal. In addition, the financial improprieties and incompetence of the East India Company's directors precipitated in 1772 a huge crisis in London banking circles in which a dozen leading banks in the city went under. But by then, a major campaign had been unleashed in the British press against the misrule and corruption of company officials in India and the menace of the returning nabobs. After the banking crisis of 1772, the climate was so hostile to the company that most members of parliament seemed to be, quote, in a humor to hang both directors and servants. In 1773, Robert Clive, the much celebrated founder of the Indian Empire, was accused in parliament of having abused his powers to illegally acquire vast sums of money. In his defense, Clive told parliament, quote, Consider the situation in which the victory at Plassey had placed me. A great prince was dependent on my pleasure. An opulent city lay at my mercy. Its richest bankers bid against each other for my smiles. I walked through vaults which were thrown open to me alone, piled on either hand with gold and jewels. Mr. Chairman, at this moment I stand astonished at my own moderation. After contentious hearings and a night-long debate, he was found to have received presents, but was cleared of any criminal wrongdoing. Eight years later, however, the controversy resumed with no less a figure than Edmund Burke, leading the charge in Parliament against the company and its Governor General, Warren Hastings. Through protracted hearings and votes over more than a decade, Parliament debated the charges of high crimes and misdemeanors against Hastings, who claimed Burke had brought the British nation into disgrace. Hastings, he said, was, quote, the greatest delinquent that India ever saw, and had, moreover, imbibed Eastern corruption. Quote, this was the golden cup of abominations, this the chalice of fornications, of rapine, usury, and oppression, which was held out by the gorgeous eastern harlot, which so many of the people, so many of the nobles of this land had drained to the last dregs. The real danger was that eastern corruption was now making its way into British society. Quote, they marry into your families, they enter into your senate, they ease your estate by loans. This was the dangerous underside of commerce that threatened to destroy virtue. Burke was determined to prevent such a disaster. In his defense, Hastings invoked difference. India was not Britain, he said. It could not be ruled by British principles. 
If he had in his own conduct deviated from British norms, it was because Indian conditions demanded it. Quote, the whole history of Asia is nothing more than precedence to prove the invariable exercise of arbitrary power. Sovereignty in India implies nothing else than despotism. Burke, in his reply, was merciless. Quote, these gentlemen have formed a plan of geographic morality by which the duties of men in public and in private situations are not to be governed by their relations to the great governor of the universe, but by their relations, or by their relations to men, but by climates, degrees of longitude and latitude. This was a license for corruption and abuse of power. Burke's claim was that Indians had their own ancient constitution, their own laws, their own legitimate dynasties. A British governor ruling by true British principles ought to have respected those institutions and customs and not, like Hastings, arrogantly cast them aside in order to introduce British forms with the substance of despotism. Empire had to become a sacred responsibility, a patriotic duty answerable to the nation. It had to become a business not of intrigue and loot, but of virtue. As it happened, Hastings was in the end exonerated. But by bringing him to trial in Parliament, Burke, quote, made empire safe for British sovereignty. Britain could now claim that the good despotism it provided was much better than the bad despotism India had known before conquest. It is important to realize that this new justification of empire required a quite new deployment of political concepts. The American empires, peopled by European settlers, were governed by European principles. Indigenous American populations, either annihilated or marginalized and suppressed, were not part of the political order, whether in the colonial period or in the republics created after the Creole revolutions. Native American elites and their institutions did not need to be incorporated within the structures of law and government. The Eastern colonies, founded in the 18th century, however, were not settler colonies. Europeans had to rule there by bringing native elites into the new structures of colonial government and recognizing local laws and customs. This posed an entirely new problem for Western political theory. Under what terms could a modern European power deploy non-modern and non-Western institutions in governing an Eastern colony? I will argue that the modern state as we know it today was normalized in the, early, in the early 19th century. The experience of empire in its earlier incarnation of the conquest and settlement of America as well as the new possessions in the East is fundamental to this process. In fact, I'm willing to speculate that the modern state as we know it today would have looked very different had the European powers not had overseas empires. The key conceptual move was to think of all forms of government everywhere as comparable within a single universal normative framework. Some crucial theoretical instruments were provided in the 19th century by British utilitarian thinkers. Writing his Principles of Morals and Legislation in 1789, Jeremy Bentham announced that the methods and standards of legislation he was proposing were, quote, alike applicable to the laws of all nations. More interestingly, in an essay on the influence of time and place in matters of legislation, Bentham proposed the following method. Quote, I take England then for a standard, and referring everything to this standard, I inquire, what are the deviations which it would be requisite to make from this standard in giving to another country such a tincture as any other country may receive without prejudice from English laws. The problem as it stands at present is the best possible laws from England being established in England required the variations which it would be necessary to make in those of any other given country in order to render them the best laws possible with reference to that country. In providing an instructive example of this method, Bentham chose a country that presented as strong a contrast with England as possible. Quote from Bentham, such a contrast we seem to have in the province of Bengal. 
diversity of climate, mixture, mixture of inhabitants, natural productions, face of the country, present laws, manners, customs, religion of the inhabitants, every circumstance on which a difference in the point in question can be grounded as different as can be. To a lawgiver who having been bred up with English notions shall have learnt how to accommodate his laws to the circumstances of Bengal, no other part of the globe can present any difficulty. Cultural difference here is no longer radically incommensurable, as it was with Montesquieu in the 18th century. Rather, it can now be understood as deviation from a standard and hence normalized. All deviations between states are comparable according to the same measure. States can be divided into ranks and grades. Moreover, once normalized, deviations could be tracked over time. The deviation of a state from the norm could close or widen. This, I believe, was a key conceptual innovation in the theory of the modern state, in which the history of empire played a central role. It is the combination of utilitarianism and evangelical Christianity that characterized the era of high imperialism in the 19th century, which put in place the modern ideology of empire. This was when representative government was gradually declared the normal form of the modern nation state, applicable universally as the desirable norm. But actual historical conditions might require the making of exceptions. Indeed, the theoretical foundation of the modern empire as defined in the 19th century now rested precisely in the power to declare the colony as an exception. Race, religion, language, geography, historical tradition, any of these could be the criterion for deciding that colonies inhabited by non-European peoples were not ready for representative government. But difference too was normalized within a universal framework of comparative government where difference was now conceived as deviation from the norm. Thus he was born in the 19th century, the modern civilizing mission, empire, as a pedagogical project. The history of British India by James Mill, virtually canonical in the field of European knowledge in Indian history in the early 19th century, was first published in 1817. Mill was a utilitarian and a reformist thinker in the new Benthamite tradition. His chapter on the capture of Calcutta by Siraj Dola mentions the black hole incident, but frames it within a paradigm of social ethics that would have been incomprehensible to the 18th century characters we have encountered so far. Mill describes the confusion and disorder surrounding the retreat from the fort on July, June 19, 1756 as bordering on criminal negligence of duty, but something that should have been expected given the lack of proper principles of government in the affairs of the East India Company at the time. After the surrender of the fort, Mill says, following Holwell's narrative, Siraj Dola did not show any cruelty to the British captives. Rather, the British in Calcutta were themselves to blame for maintaining dungeon-like prisons. Quote, had no black hole existed, as none ought to exist anywhere, least of all in the sultry and unwholesome climate of Bengal, those who perished in the black hole of Calcutta would have experienced a different fate. This was the intellectual climate in which the Black Hole Monument was demolished in 1821. It has been speculated that its continuance had become politically undesirable, either as likely to wound the sensibilities of our native fellow subjects or to recall prominently at the seat of government a hideous disaster to British arms, which it would be wiser to locally bury in oblivion. However, it is also likely that its inappropriate use by local people contributed to the decision to pull down the monument. An early 19th century illustration by James Bailey Fraser shows the original monument, which, which shows the original monument, drew the following comment from a 20th century British historian of Calcutta. Quote, the obelisk in the last named engraving looks at least 50 feet high and is not surrounded by any railings. It seems in consequence to be the lounging place for lower class loafers of all sorts who gossip squatting around and against it. A barber is seen plying his craft in the favorite posture of these Eastern experts. His back is to the base of the monument, 
while overhead is stretched his outspread cloth between the upper ledge of the pedestal and three or four stakes. The tent thus improvised shelters the operator and a few of his customers. All this unsightliness may explain why the historic structure had a few years before the date of this engraving disappeared from the city of palaces. If we are indeed prepared to see metropolis and colony as part of a single history, as the new historians of empire are arguing today, then we must take seriously the history of 19th century imperialism as a constitutive part of the history of the modern nation state in Europe and North America. If we do this, I suggest, we, we may not be surprised, as Bernard Porter has claimed to be, by the general ignorance among 19th century Britons about the empire, or indeed by the wide gulf that seemed to separate domestic from colonial policy. If we keep the framework of norm, deviation, and exception in mind, we will see why, alongside the growing power of the bourgeoisie and the extension of the suffrage in British domestic politics, Colonial government in the 19th century was run by men from the upper middle classes with a university education in the classics, suffused by a patrician spirit of virtue that had disappeared from British domestic politics. We will see why a paternal authoritarianism could be, could be justified for the colonies with such moral fervor, and why its equally frequently arbitrary policies could even be concealed from an allegedly uninformed an uncomprehending metropolitan public opinion. The black hole of Calcutta would have been forgotten had it not been for the essayist skills of Thomas Babington Macaulay. In 1840, he wrote an essay on Robert Clive that was read by every English reading school child for the next 100 years. <laughs> this essay turned the black hole story into a founding myth of empire. Macaulay's essay was tragic biography and heroic history. The black hole played the crucial part in it. India, in the middle of the 18th century, he wrote, was, quote, tainted with all the vices of oriental despotism, with a succession of rulers sunk in indolence and, in indolence and debauchery, chewing bang, fondling concubines, and listening to buffoons. Macaulay betrayed a wholly new historical sensibility when he asked the question, in what was this confusion to end? Was the strife to continue during centuries, this was when an utterly unexpected and wholly providential chain of events unfolded. Siraj, quote, one of the worst specimens of the Oriental despot, committed that great crime, memorable for its singular atrocity, memorable for the tremendous retribution by which it was followed. Turning Holwell's narrative into a story of the criminal cruelties of Oriental rulers, Macaulay made Siraj the chief perpetrator of a horrible atrocity. Having ordered the forced confinement of the unfortunate prisoners at the point of the sword, the despot was unavailable for the rest of the night for any appeals because he was, quote, sleeping off his debauch. In the morning, he treated the survivors with execrable cruelty. And the mysterious Mrs. Carey, now called an Englishwoman, was, according to Macaulay, quote, placed in the harem of the prince at Murshidabad. What happened next? Quote, the cry of the whole settlement was for vengeance. The cry was heard in Madras and London, leading to the dispatch of Clive and his small army to Bengal. The rest, we might say quite accurately, is history. It is to history that Macaulay turned in judging Clive. He admitted that Clive, quote, considered oriental politics as a game in which nothing was unfair. And although an honorable English gentleman and a soldier, no sooner was he matched against an Indian intriguer than he himself became an Indian intriguer and descended without scruple to falsehood. In doing this, Clive was altogether in the wrong. There can be no moral defense of his conduct. But history must give such men, quote, a more than ordinary measure of indulgence because they must be judged not as their contemporaries judge them, but as they will be judged by posterity. This judgment would be that Clive was a supremely intelligent and valorous agent of the providential acquisition by Britain of its Indian empire. His faults were the faults of a bygone era. Now, quote, 
A great quantity of wealth is made by English functionaries in India, but no single functionary makes a very large fortune. And what is made is slowly, hardly, and honestly earned. The institutions of British rule in India had been reformed. Empire was now safe from its own infamous origins. It is vitally important, I think, to emphasize the novelty of the empires instituted in the 19th century because they, invest, they invented and put in place technologies of government that were part of an entirely modern regime of power. Thus, the fact that the British Empire in India was in the 19th century so crucially dependent on collaborating Indians, from soldiers to merchants to landlords to clerks, was not a limit on imperial power at all but precisely the mark of its productive efflorescence. It is equally important, I believe, to take seriously the myth of imperial hegemony, not because the actual British experience of empire was homogeneous, which, is, which it was not, but because actual practices were effectively instituted that sustained and made credible the myth of invincible imperial hegemony. Crucially, the concepts of sovereignty and government were separated by utilitarians such as the Mills, father and son. And in order to advance the argument that what really mattered were the consequences of government, not its source. If the British governed India better than the Indian princes, then why should it matter that the rulers were alien and not native? Besides, on the plane of sovereignty too, a range of flexible practices were developed to deal with political entities that were no longer seen to qualify as entitled to equal sovereignty with European powers. In the 17th and 18th century, European powers made treaties with Indian rulers as equal sovereigns, precisely to secure agreements, concessions, and even surrender of territory that might be deemed valid according to European principles of the law of nations. But when British paramountcy was secured over the Indian subcontinent in the 19th century, Indian rulers were no longer regarded as legally entitled to equal sovereignty. Instead, the notion emerged of graded sovereignty, based not on legal principle, but on strategic calculations of policy. Indian states were deemed to possess internal sovereignty, but not powers to establish diplomatic relations with other states. Even internal sovereignty was subject to intervention by the British colonial power ranging from the management of the economy and tax system to reform of the administration and legal system to outright annexation on grounds of the failure of government. The concepts of protectorate, indirect rule, and the administration of customary law used widely in the British colonies of Africa were developed in India in the 19th century. More generally, the global practices of sovereignty where the great powers would deal with one another as equal sovereigns but make ex exceptions to the law of nations when dealing with lesser powers, continue into our own times when there are no more colonies, and yet imperialist interventions have not ceased. Let us return to the black hole story, finally. Actually canonical in the field of European knowledge in Indian history in the early 19th century was first published in 1817. Mill was a utilitarian, and a reformist thinker in the new Benthamite tradition. His chapter on the capture of Calcutta by Siraj Dola mentions the black hole incident, but frames it within a paradigm of social ethics that would have been incomprehensible to the 18th century characters we have encountered so far. Mill describes the confusion and disorder surrounding the retreat from the fort on July, June 19, 1756 as bordering on criminal negligence of duty, but something that should have been expected given the lack of proper principles of government in the affairs of the East India Company at the time. After the surrender of the fort, Mill says, following Holwell's narrative, Siraj Dola did not show any cruelty to the British captives. Rather, the British in Calcutta were themselves to blame for maintaining dungeon-like prisons. Quote, had no black hole existed, as none ought to exist anywhere, least of all in the sultry and unwholesome climate of Bengal, those who perished in the black hole of Calcutta would have experienced a different fate. This was the intellectual climate in which the black hole monument was demolished in 1821. It has been speculated 
that its continuance had become politically undesirable, either as likely to wound the sensibilities of our native fellow subjects or to recall prominently at the seat of government a hideous disaster to British arms, which it would be wiser to locally bury in oblivion. However, it is also likely that its inappropriate use by local people contributed to the decision to pull down the monument. An early 19th century illustration by James Bailey Fraser shows the original monument, which, which shows the original monument, drew the following comment from a 20th century British historian of Calcutta. Quote, the obelisk in the last named engraving looks at least 50 feet high and is not surrounded by any railings. It seems in consequence to be the lounging place for lower class loafers of all sorts who gossip squatting around and against it. A barber is seen plying his craft in the favorite posture of these Eastern experts. His back is to the base of the monument, while overhead is stretched his outspread cloth between the upper ledge of the pedestal and three or four stakes. The tent thus improvised shelters the operator and a few of his customers. All this unsightliness may explain why the historic structure had a few years before the date of this engraving disappeared from the city of palaces. If we are indeed prepared to see metropolis and colony as part of a single history, as the new historians of empire are arguing today, then we must take seriously the history of 19th century imperialism as a constitutive part of the history of the modern nation state in Europe and North America. If we do this, I suggest, we, we may not be surprised, as Bernard Porter has claimed to be, by the general ignorance among 19th century Britons about the empire or indeed by the wide gulf that seemed to separate domestic from colonial policy. If we keep the framework of norm, deviation, and exception in mind, we will see why, alongside the growing power of the bourgeoisie and the extension of the suffrage in British domestic politics, colonial government in the 19th century was run by men from the upper middle classes with a university education in the classics, suffused by a patrician spirit of virtue that had disappeared from British domestic politics. We will see why a paternal authoritarianism could be, could be justified for the colonies with such moral fervor, and why its equally frequently arbitrary policies could even be concealed from an allegedly uninformed and uncomprehending metropolitan public opinion. The black hole of Calcutta would have been forgotten had it not been for the essayist skills of Thomas Babington Macaulay. In 1840, he wrote an essay on Robert Clive that was read by every English reading school child for the next 100 years. <laughs> this essay turned the black hole story into a founding myth of empire. Macaulay's essay was tragic biography and heroic history. The black hole played the crucial part in it. India, in the middle of the 18th century, he wrote, was, quote, tainted with all the vices of oriental despotism with a succession of rulers sunk in indolence and, de indolence and debauchery, chewing bang, fondling concubines, and listening to buffoons. Macaulay betrayed a wholly new historical sensibility when he asked the question, in what was this confusion to end? Was the strife to continue during centuries? This was when an utterly unexpected and wholly providential chain of events unfolded. Siraj, quote, one of the worst specimens of the Oriental despot committed that great crime, memorable for its singular atrocity, memorable for the tremendous retribution by which it was followed. Turning Holwell's narrative into a story of the criminal cruelties of Oriental rulers, Macaulay made Siraj the chief perpetrator of a horrible atrocity. Having ordered the forced confinement of the unfortunate prisoners at the point of the sword, the despot was unavailable for the rest of the night for any appeals because he was, quote, sleeping off his debauch. In the morning, he treated the survivors with execrable cruelty. And the mysterious Mrs. Carey, now called an Englishwoman, was, according to Macaulay, quote, placed in the harem of the prince at Murshidabad. What happened next? Quote, the cry of the whole settlement was for vengeance. The cry was heard in Madras and London, leading to the dispatch of Clive and his small army to Bengal. The rest, we might say quite accurately, is history. 
It is to history that Macaulay turned in judging Clive. He admitted that Clive, quote, considered Oriental politics as a game in which nothing was unfair. And although an honorable English gentleman and a soldier, no sooner was he matched against an Indian intriguer than he himself became an Indian intriguer and descended without scruple to falsehood. In doing this, Clive was altogether in the wrong. There can be no moral defense of his conduct. But history must give such men, quote, a more than ordinary measure of indulgence because they must be judged not as their contemporaries judged them, but as they will be judged by posterity. This judgment would be that Clive was a supremely intelligent and valorous agent of the providential acquisition by Britain of its Indian empire. His faults were the faults of a bygone era. Now, quote, a great quantity of wealth is made by English functionaries in India, but no single functionary makes a very large fortune and what is made is slowly, hardly, and honestly earned. The institutions of British rule in India had been reformed. Empire was now safe from its own infamous origins. It is vitally important, I think, to emphasize the novelty of the empires instituted in the 19th century because they, invest, they invented and put in place technologies of government that were part of an entirely modern regime of power. Thus, the fact that the British Empire in India was in the 19th century so crucially dependent on collaborating Indians, from soldiers to merchants to landlords to clerks, was not a limit on imperial power at all, but precisely the mark of its productive efflorescence. It is equally important, I believe, to take seriously the myth of imperial hegemony, not because the actual British experience of empire was homogeneous, which, is, which it was not, but because actual practices were effectively instituted that sustained and made credible the myth of invincible imperial hegemony. Crucially, the concepts of sovereignty and government were separated by utilitarians such as the Mills, father and son, and in order to advance the argument that what really mattered were the consequences of government, not its source. If the British governed India better than the Indian princes, then why should it matter that the rulers were alien and not native? Besides, on the plane of sovereignty too, a range of flexible practices were developed to deal with political entities that were no longer seen to qualify as entitled to equal sovereignty with European powers. In the 17th and 18th century, European powers made treaties with Indian rulers as equal sovereigns precisely to secure agreements, concessions, and even surrender of territory that might be deemed valid according to European principles of the law of nations. But when British paramountcy was secured over the Indian subcontinent in the 19th century, Indian rulers were no longer regarded as legally entitled to equal sovereignty. Instead, the notion emerged of graded sovereignty, based not on legal principle, but on strategic calculations of policy. Indian states were deemed to possess internal sovereignty, but not powers to establish diplomatic relations with other states. Even internal sovereignty was subject to intervention by the British colonial power, ranging from the management of the economy and tax system to reform of the administration and legal system to outright annexation on grounds of the failure of government. The concepts of protectorate, indirect rule, and the administration of customary law used widely in the British colonies of Africa were developed in India in the 19th century. More generally, the global practices of sovereignty, where the great powers would deal with one another as equal sovereigns, but make ex exceptions to the law of nations when dealing with lesser powers, continue into our own times when there are no more colonies, and yet, imperialist interventions have not ceased. Let us return to the black hole story, finally. The campaign <coughs> to restore the monument began in earnest in the 1880s. H.E. Bastide published a history of Calcutta recounting in detail the history of the black hole and bemoaning the fact that there was no commemorative structure sacred to those few faithful found among the faithless. 
He also claimed that Mrs. Carey, quote, of a fair mestitia color with correct regular features, which gave evident marks of beauty, was not the only woman in the black hole. There were probably three or four others, even though he doubted that she had been consigned to the Nawab's harem. Incidentally, the Victoria Memorial Hall in Calcutta now has a snuff box allegedly belonging to Warren Hastings in which there is a little picture of somebody that's identified as Mrs. Carey, survivor of the Black Hole Prison. There's rich irony in the fact that someone who was supposedly confined, uh, consigned to the harem in Mushidabad also found her way into Warren Hastings' snuff box. Uh, <laughs> excavations were carried out in 1883 among the ruins of the old fort and the foundations of the prison identified. In 1902, Curzon took it upon himself to rebuild at considerable personal expense the monument at the corner of Delousey Square. He also converted the site of the Black Hole Prison into a memorial for the heroic martyrs of early empire. Curzon certainly had no doubts about the nobility as well as the legitimacy of his civilizing mission. But by then, Indian opinion was in no mood to countenance the founding myth of empire. In 1896, Bolanath Chandra published an article in which he questioned whether it was possible to pack 146 humans into a room 18 feet square. Quote, even if it were possible to closely pack them like the seeds of a pomegranate. He concluded, quote, geometry contradicting arithmetic gives the lie to the story. It is little better than a bogey against which was raised an uproar of pity. In 1898, the historian Okhai Kumar Moitro published an influential book on Siraj in which, in which he challenged the European accounts of the Nawab's misrule and cruelties. In 1916, he was joined by a British schoolmaster called J.H. Little in the Calcutta Historical Society in pronouncing, the story of the black hole, the, in pronouncing that the story of the black hole was, quote, a gigantic hoax provoking a long and angry response from Curzon himself, then living in retirement in Britain. By then, Bengali poets and playwrights had turned Siraj into a tragic hero, the last sovereign ruler of Bengal. The founding myth of empire had been turned into the founding calumny. In 1940, there was an elected provincial ministry in Bengal led by a coalition of Muslim political parties. Led by Subhash Chandra Bose, then banished from the Indian National Congress, various students' organization began a campaign for the removal of Curzon's Black Hole Monument from the central square of the city. The movement aroused a surprising response, spreading quickly from district to district, invoking sentiments extremely unusual for those days of sectarian conflict of a joint front of Hindus and Muslims against a colonial canard. <coughs> Pressurized by its own constituents, the government of Fazlul Haq decided in July 1940 to remove the monument to St. John's Church, where it still stands in profound obscurity. One cannot blame the fickleness of popular memory for the obliteration of the black hole. In 1947, the famous Indian historian Jadunath Sarkar claimed that Holwell's story was an exaggeration and that the total number of prisoners who died was probably 60. In 1962, Brijen Gupta published what is considered the definitive historical work on the subject in which he considered every available piece of evidence and came to the conclusion that the number of dead was 53, among whom many were likely to have been injured from the three-day siege, a not unusual incident in 18th century warfare. The historian's consensus today can be grasped from the fact that the volume published in 1987 in the new Cambridge History of India on the conquest of Bengal does not even list the black hole in its index. It is not worthy of even a mention. And the site of the black hole prison, which Curzon had turned into a sacred monument, this was the old one, is now a rubbish dump. Does this mean then that empire has been fully consigned to a dead past or is it simply that the founding myths have changed? Do we not hear arguments today that 
justify external intervention on the ground of failed governance or the failure to protect lives? Do we not have graded sovereignty, even though each member of the United Nations has one vote in the General Assembly? Do we not hear arguments that still suggest that while there are universally desirable norms of self-government, they must be suspended in certain cases because those societies are culturally unprepared for self-government? Are we not, in fact, separating sovereignty from government and claiming, whether sincerely or disingenuously, that what really matters are the consequences of the latter? And as the balance of global economic power shifts, do we not have new aspirants to imperial status who are adopting exactly the same practices that were developed in the 19th century? I have told you a story about an old empire, but the questions I wish to leave you with are those of our present day and age. Our answers, I'm suggesting, might be better informed by our knowledge of the history of modern empires and nations. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we would normally have a bit of a question and answer session, but uh, we did expect uh, to be able to release you around now, so I'm going to beg your forgiveness in, in not taking questions and answers and just uh, conclude the, the, afternoon, the evening. Uh, what a wonderful demonstration of, um, of history, history telling, memory, truth, and how these, uh, the vicissitudes of those, and especially, I suppose, of how uh, history is used as an instrument of politics and, and of change. Um, thank you so much for that uh, enlightening story. And in a sense, storytelling clearly is one of the things that you do excel at. And to be able to make uh, the complexities of um, <coughs> thinking about empire about nationalism, uh, about um, colonialism, as accessible to many of us who are not uh, steeped in those disciplines through the vehicle of wonderful storytelling is just another uh, of, your, of your virtues. So um, I have a small a gift to give you an, on behalf of the university, if you would just come up. And um, it is uh, a book from the university, also very much about the history of South Africa, uh, some of its colonial past, and what we can remember from it and reconstruct memory. Uh, so thank you so much for delivering this open lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, students for Having joined us this evening, it's been a marvelous turnout, and I urge you to keep, your, keep an eye on the announcements of other open, lecture, open vice chancellor lectures and to join us again in the future. Thank you all very much. Thank you.